Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Korea has a culture rich in poetry, yet the language barrier makes it difficult for foreign audiences to access it. For this episode, we spoke to brother Anthony of Tese about the history and the aesthetics of Korean poetry, about the difficulties translating it with all its nuances and context, and about Goen, who has been labeled as the people's poet of Korea and is one of the country's most famous and prolific writers. Brother Anthony is Emeritus Professor in the English Department of Sogang University and Chair Professor at Danguk University. In 1994, he was naturalized as a South Korean citizen under the name An Son Jae, and since then has been awarded the Ok Gwan Order of Merit for Culture by the Korean government, as well as an honorary member of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. He has also received numerous awards for his translations of Korean poetry. Brother Anthony, welcome to Korea and the World. Yeah, thank you very much. A question some of our listeners may have, why brother and why brother Anthony of Tese? Tese is the name of a village in France, and since 1940 or so, Tese has been the home of a community of brothers, a Christian ecumenical community, people living together, praying together for a whole lifetime. And I joined the community in 1969, and um, so I am Brother Anthony of the community of Tese, and so that's the full expression of who I am. What brought you to Korea initially, and why did you decide to actually be naturalized Korean? Our community came to know Cardinal Kim, the Catholic Archbishop of Seoul, sometime in the 70s. First of all, early he came to Tese in France. Later we met him again in Hong Kong, and he invited our community to send brothers to Korea. And um, I was one of those sort of asked if I would like to go to Korea, and I said yes. So that's how I came. And having come, I seem to have stayed. And after about 12 years in Korea, you get bored going to the immigration and um, you want to sort of put down a, some more firmer roots. Uh, so I decided then to take Korean nationality. That was about 1994. Where does your interest in Korean poetry come from? Well, when I came to Korea, I didn't know what we were going to be doing, but one important thing was, of course, that we would have to earn our living as part of our life. And um, I got a job teaching in Sogang University. And in the old days, when I was a student, I was studying literature, European literature, older literature. And one day in Sogang, they said, could you teach Chaucer? And then could you teach Shakespeare? So I found myself teaching full-time older English literature in Soga. And after a few years of that, I'd also studied some Korean, of course. I said one day to one of the Korean professors that I thought I ought also to be interested in Korean poetry, at least modern poetry, and perhaps try to translate some. Uh, and she then recommended a poet whom she knew very well personally, Ku Sang. And that's really how I started to translate Korean poetry as a kind of counterpart to teaching British poetry to Koreans. Before going any further, could you possibly read us a poem representative of what Koreans appreciate in poetry? Well, what about this? Back to Heaven by Chun Sang Byung. I'll go back to heaven again, hand in hand with the dew that melts at a touch of the dawning day. I'll go back to heaven again, with the dusk together, just we two, at a sign from a cloud, after playing on the slopes. I'll go back to heaven again, at the end of my outing to this beautiful world. I'll go back and say, that was beautiful. Now that's a very, very famous Korean poem, Kui Chan by Chan Sang Byung. Why did you choose that poem specifically? What characteristics does it have that Koreans tend to appreciate? 
Well, it depends what Koreans you're thinking about. I mean, obviously, people Koreans like imagery from nature, uh, you know, dusk and dawn and sunset and sunrise. And But I, I like this poem because it has a history behind it. Uh, Chun Sang Byung's friends were in opposition to Pak Chung Hee in the 60s, and some of them even visited the North Korean embassy in Berlin, East Berlin. And then he was arrested because he was their friend. And he was very, very innocent guy, very like a child. And he wasn't playing the game of the um, intelligence services, so they, they beat him up and they gave him some nice electric torture. And in 1970, so a few years later, he'd been living in Seoul, no real home, not really eating much. 1970 he fell ill, he was down in Pusan staying with his brother and he was 40 years old then, he thought he was dying. So this poem is about dying, I'll go back to heaven again, it's about dying, Kui Chan. He thought he was dying and he'd been beaten up, imprisoned, tortured for no reason, he wasn't at all political and um, yet uh, at this point in his life the last and only thing he really wants to say about life in this world is that it was beautiful. And the only thing that could possibly have made it beautiful for him was the fact of human friendship. Because that's all he ever had. His friends gave him some money to help him survive, they paid for his drinks, and so on, and kept him company. Uh, it's a beautiful poem also in a very human way, not just words. Does Korea have a long tradition of poetry? Like every country, Korea has a tradition of poetry, but a lot of it is lost. We never, they never wrote it down. The poetry that has come down from the past, a lot of it is in classical Chinese and modeled on the Chinese poetry, the Chinese poetic tradition. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about the Korean poetry of the past. There was also poetry that was clearly written, composed, sung in colloquial Korean, which is very different from classical Chinese. And then when you come into the 20th century, really the Koreans started all over again. Once they came into contact, mostly through Japanese translations in fact, they came into contact with Western poetry, modern poetry, French poetry, 19th century French poetry, and all sorts of free verse and so on. So that Korean poetry was reinvented early in the 20th century, and that's what today poets are writing mostly. There is the Shi Jo, which is a fairly traditional form, a fixed form, which some people still favor and some people even try to write it in English, but that's rather a sideline. Is it possible to apply Western criterions to Korean poetry, such as rhymes or meters? No, not at all. Korean poetry, the basic modern Korean poetry, is always free verse, and quite often even then prose poetry, because Korean language has far too many syllables to be able to do anything like counting syllables, and Korean doesn't really do rhyme either, it doesn't work. Every, every sentence ends in da. It's not really very interesting. So Korean poetry is free, free verse. Uh, there are rhythms, it depends on the poets, but the rhythms are the rhythms of speech, of spoken rhythms, not fixed form rhythms. It's very different actually really from, from English. Some poets, their rhythms are somehow related to folk music, say, and the, which again is very different. The rhythms of Korean folk music have nothing to do with our 4-4 four, four, whatever. So it's, it's very different. Korean as a language is obviously very distinct from Western languages. As a translator, how much do you think is lost in translation when Korean poetry is translated in English or any other Western language? Yes, it's totally different, and um, like I say, the sounds and rhythms are very different, and then the whole order of words and the order of phrases are totally different. I don't know if it's lost, but it's totally transformed. It's up to you how much freedom you take and how close you can stay. My own 
feeling is that you should try to translate what the Korean poem says. I mean, you can't really say it as the Korean says it, but after all, this is going to be published as a poem by, and then the Korean name, not my name. So I have a duty to the Korean poet to try to ensure that the uh, Western reader, person reading the translation, gets as close as they can to what, what the poet was saying in the Korean. You wrote, and I quote, that, as in many other markedly nationalistic cultures, there exists a conviction in Korea that the Korean language is untranslatable and, for non-Koreans, incomprehensible. Do you agree with that conviction? Well, I've published 30 volumes and there are more coming out, so it can't be that untranslatable. Um, it's not totally untranslatable. I say you cannot do it as sometimes Koreans want it to be done, what they call word for word, when you can't do it because the words don't fit and the structures don't fit. So it's always going to be quite different, and yet you want it to be the same. Translation is in theory impossible, but everybody does it, else we couldn't communicate. That's what I think, that um, Korean poetry is going to be translated into some kind of, by me, English poetry. Uh, it won't be quite the same poem, but at the same time, I do feel, maybe also because I'm not, I don't feel competent to transform it radically. The poems that I publish are as close as I can get to what I think the Korean is saying. But then my Korean isn't that good. I always really need a Korean who also knows English to come back and say, no, that's not what it really means. Because Korean is just so obscure and unclear and ambiguous, and ambiguous that very often you, know, you just really don't know who is doing what to whom or saying what. What are the main challenges you face when translating poetry in general? Yeah, well, as I say, I mean, the challenge is, first of all, do I understand what these words mean? and what this poem is about. And then, of course, the challenge is how am I going to put that into English in such a way that it doesn't betray the essential meaning and whatever of the poem. What are the main difficulties specific to the Korean language? The verb comes at the end. That's always the problem. And the end in a Korean sentence sometimes is a very long way away from the beginning. This is even worse in translating prose than in translating poetry. That you, you have to wait five minutes before you realize that the sentence that you are hearing or translating is, in fact, question. Or ends with not. This is the main problem with Korean. It does not follow our principles of logic. In Korean, different levels of grammar are used to indicate social hierarchy or feelings, how are those dealt with? Yeah, well, that's more a problem in fiction than it is in poetry, much more. Uh, in poetry, it's not really a problem at all. But in fiction, of course, you have people talking to each other, dialogue in fiction. And that's a big challenge because the translator, first of all, has to notice and then feel the implications of the grammatical forms being used. This person is using chandemal or panmal, and of course those things don't exist in English, so you have to find other ways of indicating the implication of a particular style. He spoke in a friendly tone, in a sarcastic tone, in a humiliating manner, whatever. Because you just can't do it by grammar. You don't have the grammar in English. Are there things that are easily lost in translations with regards to the context of Korean poetry? Yeah, well, that's, of course, a big question, especially with somebody like Cohen. But a lot of the earlier poets that I translated, you, their own personal history and the history of Korea through which they lived and wrote is as interesting as the poems they wrote. And the poems they wrote relate to, emerge from, a very specifically Korean history, whether it's the history of Korean War, or before that the Japanese period, or after the war, resistance to dictatorship, or just the processes of urbanization, industrialization, modernization. Uh, all of that is playing a role in Korean literature, poetry, or fiction. 
which has no equivalent in, in British or American poetry of today because Britain and America have not undergone this radical social transformation that Korea has in the last 60 years, say 70 years. Uh, it depends a little bit, but for example, I translated the poet Shin Gyeong Nim. Shin Gyeong Nim, as a young man, spent about 10 years as a laborer, as a market salesman, wandering the countryside, working on building sites and everything, and then came back to his first collection of poetry called Farmer's Dance. And that volume, the experience in that volume, is rooted in his experience of the transformation of Korean society from rural to urban, from traditional to modern, with all the pain emerging out of the after the Korean War. Uh, and if you don't know that background, you're not really going to understand what the poems often are talking about. The conflict which are somehow echoed there and the regrets and the sorrows and anything which is unspoken unspoken is unspoken but somewhere you have to know what what the background is are there poems that are just untranslatable you would say in theory no <laughs> but there are poems that there are some poems that Koreans are quite fond of which i am sure will never be very interesting, no matter how you translate them, if you translate them straight anyway, especially like lyric poems. There's Kim So Wal from the 1920s, there's his famous poem about azaleas, but there's another one he wrote about flowers in mountains, Yu Zanhua. And all it says is, in the mountains, flowers are blooming. And that's about it. Uh, so it doesn't matter how you translate it, it is never going to mean much. But Koreans love this poem. It's a song. They've put it to music. It's, it's an evocation because Koreans have been taught that when you hear these words in the mountains, flowers are blooming, that then you imagine the mountains you have seen and the flowers blooming in the mountains and the birds and the what's it and the thingamy. And then you bring in your own nationalistic feelings about our land, which is Korea, which is the land of mountains and rivers, and you somehow add to the poem a whole series of things that are not in it, and you can't bring in in, in translation, and that a non-Korean is not going to bring. You mentioned that Koreans are told to imagine the mountains and the flowers. Who tells them? How does the average Korean acquire a sense of aesthetics when it comes to poetry? Oh, almost all, nowadays they don't get it because they're not being taught anything like that. They're only taught how to answer exam questions. But until about 15, 20 years ago in school, middle school, high school textbooks, Korean language, culture textbooks, they had quite a lot of poems and the poems were chosen from the earlier 20th century either from the um, Japanese period, like Kim so -wol, or afterwards, Pang mok -wol. a whole series of classical poets with short poems, not too difficult, obviously not political in opposition terms, but nice poems, often poems which somehow expressed a positive attitude to life and so on. Uh, so the Koreans all learnt these poems uh, in such a way that they were told also what they were about and how they should react to them. And this is a famous poem, this is a beautiful poem. And Koreans are not by nature very controversial. If somebody tells you this is beautiful, they say, ah, this is beautiful. That's it. Especially they often found in the poetry that they learnt during their classes a sort of vision of, a positive vision of life that they didn't get at home or in society or listening to the radio or whatever. But somehow poetry, for many, many children back then, was the place where they realized that there were almost eternal, real values of beauty, truth, goodness. Eh? And they ha also had to memorize these poems, and the poems they memorized somehow stayed with them again, as a kind of reminder that there is something other than just 
working hard, not having much fun. Is it easy to have translated Korean poetry published in English? No, it's impossible. I mean, it's impossible to have translated poetry published, as everybody knows, especially translated into English. Of course, in England or, or well, United Kingdom or in North America, only about 3% of the books published of any kind are translations, because there are just so many people writing in English. Whereas in other countries, whether it's um, Western European countries, say, often it's 15% of the books published in a year are going to be translations. But of course, a lot of those books, that 3% in North America or that 15% in Europe, well, the 3% is not all literature. Most of it will not be literature. Cookery books or golf books or whatever, history. And then in Western Europe, of course, huge numbers of books translated are going to be translated from English. You know, American bestsellers, British bestsellers. It's quite hard. And everybody knows poetry doesn't sell. There are very few poetry publishers, or they are simply non-profit. They have very limited distribution. They can't afford to pay booksellers to have big displays of poetry, and poetry is hidden in a back shelf somewhere. Also, it's very rare to find uh, journals which publish reviews of poetry, and especially of translated poetry. They just don't, don't have space for so many other books. So poetry is not, it's a very minority interest and it's very hard to get it published. When approaching a work to translate, what are your criteria? Do you translate things you find beautiful, things that you think should be translated for their historical or social values? How do you pick your next translation? I don't know, it just happens. It comes along one way or another. I have no project or plan and you know, I find myself translating something and suddenly I find myself with a completed volume or something or with a large number of, and I'm not never quite sure it's just I've heard about this poet or somehow uh, whatever uh, it'd be very hard to say I don't have a huge reading list and I have read all these poets and among all the poets I have read then I choose no <laughs> no no it's pure chance We'd like to talk about one Korean poet in particular, Ko Eun. Could you introduce him to us in a few sentences? Oh dear. Uh, Ko Eun, of course, is, he was born in 1933, so he's now well over 80. And he is perhaps the world's most prolific poet or well, writer. He has published over 150, I think 155 books. Not all poetry, novels, biographies, everything you can imagine. But also his life is as fascinating as his work in a way because he was born then 33 grew up in the countryside in western Korea, southwestern Yakunsan quite a poor farming family and then war broke out, Korean War, and uh, he's still only what 17, 18 and part members of his family were killed, his neighbors, his girlfriend and the North Koreans came down, made him transport corpses and so he had what we would call a breakdown before the end of the war and he'd just been through hell. And he came into contact, he saw one day, and just followed a Buddhist monk along the road, and the monk realized that he was in a very bad state, and said, well, the only hope for you is that you should become a monk, and sort of overcome what you have been through. So Cohen became a monk. But the point was, of course, that Cohen was no ordinary sort of farmer's kid. He was extremely intelligent. He had studied classical Chinese in the traditional manner when he was only eight years old, and he really was a very special person. So uh, as the years passed, as a monk, he started to be given all sorts of responsibilities for temples, and then he helped found the Buddhist newspaper. And it was in a Buddhist newspaper because he, he was editor of this paper and he kept having empty spaces to fill. So he would f put in a poem he'd written. He hadn't had any education in literature at all. Uh, these were just poems emerging from him. And he had read once, he says always, he came across 
a volume of poems, the first volume of poems, written by a leper monk. And um, he was deeply impressed by these poems by a leper. And he said, I want to be a leper too. Right, like that. Uh, so anyway, he didn't become a leper monk. Anyway, so he was started writing and became recognized. His poems, people say, wow, wild and intense and passionate and so on. And then he left the Buddhist clergy, he found it too constricting, and he wanted to be a poet, he decided he had to be a poet. So for years then he was a rather wild guy, nihilistic, drinking, insomnia, suicidal. Uh, until one day in 1970 or so, he read about the um, self-immolation of Chan Te Il, a young worker in Seoul who had set fire to himself and killed himself in protest against the refusal of the government and the authorities to negotiate fairly with workers. And it struck him very deeply. He said, I'm just killing myself. I want to kill myself. But here's a guy who kills himself for the good of other people. Uh, why am I so selfish? So from that moment on, he stopped wanting to get himself and threw himself into the whole struggle, anti-dictatorship, pro-democracy, pro-workers' rights, the demonstrations and the protests and all that. Of course, then getting arrested, getting beaten up and so. Until 1980, when Chantuan staged his coup, at that moment in May 1980, a couple of hundred of the main leaders of the opposition, Kim Dae-jong and others, and co on, they were all rounded up, taken away. Uh, they went through court-martial. Kim Dae-jong was sentenced to death. ko was sentenced 20 years imprisonment for thinking about something. So he was imprisoned then until 83, sentenced to 20 years He's out after two, three years, and at that moment then, as he came out of prison, while he was in prison, he had a complete sort of change of heart and uh, began to think a lot because he had nothing else to do in prison. So when he came out, he got married, re-edited all his previous poems, and while in prison then he also said, I will write a poem about everybody I've ever met or heard of, man in book. And so then the years passed, and as you come into the 1990s, Colton uh, then is able to travel abroad, and he becomes at once a sort of recognized. So he meets Seamus Heaney and Jim Borska in Poland and Brodsky and so on. And they all recognize him for a fellow spirit, a, you know, a great poet. So that's when Cohen's reputation abroad takes off. But at the same time, in the 90s, he was publishing four or five books at least every year. It sort of left the Korean readership gasping for breath and completely unable to follow. So they didn't really know what he was writing, a lot of them, and had all sorts of wrong ideas, because he'd been such a dissident before. Actually, his poetry is not political, or not even dissident, really. So anyway, Cohen incarnates in that way the whole of Korean history. How did you get in touch with his literature, and why did you decide to translate his works? Oh, well, that was a long time ago. In 1990 or 1991, I said to a friend of mine who was a professor in Seoul National, I said, I've heard about this Korean poet who reads poems at demonstrations. I think he's called Ko, and do you know anything about him? And he jumped and said, yes, yes, you're right, yes, ko and you must translate ko and you know, It turned out he was a very close friend, and uh, he was also part of the dissident, you know, anti-dictatorship, whatever. So that's how I got confirmed that I had to translate ko and then we worked together. He introduced me to the books and then to the poet, and we met and visited him, and so one thing leads to another. Could you maybe read us a segment of Cohen's poetry? Uh, there's one poem that he often reads when he's giving readings overseas. It's a poem which I think probably he wrote when he was in prison after 1980, and it's about being in prison. Sunlight. I really don't know what to do. Let me swallow my spit and my unhappiness too. An honored visitor is coming to my tiny cell with its north-facing window. It's not the chief making his rounds, but a gleam of sunlight for an instant late in the afternoon, a gleam no bigger than a square of folded pasteboard. I go crazy, it's first love, 
I hold out the palm of my hand, warm the toes of my shy, bared feet. Then, as I prostrate myself on the floor, and bask my gaunt, unreligious face in that scrap of sunlight, all too fleeting it slips away. When the visitor has receded beyond the iron bars, the room becomes several times colder and darker. This special cell in a military prison is a photographer's dark room. Without sunlight, I sometimes laughed like an idiot. One day it was a coffin. One day it was altogether the sea. Amazing, a few have survived here. Being alive is itself being at sea without a single sail in sight. Why did you choose this specific poem? Well, I say, because Cohen essentially is a witness to what many, many Koreans have been through in the last 50, 60 years, 70 years. All the suffering and then at the same time the ability to resist, not to be overwhelmed by all the harshness and cruelty, the inhumanity, the injustice, but to somehow uh, express through prose or through fiction a vision of essential the human spirit, resisting, surviving, not being cowed by fear or whatever, not compromising. Cohen has an international standing. Some even expect him to receive a Nobel Prize for literature at some point. What is he known for beyond Korea? Yeah, well, he's known as a poet, and he's been translated. I forget how many volumes of translations there are, and about 30 volumes of translation into 15 different languages, is it? Maybe more than that. All the major languages you can find translations of Cohen's poems, some of Cohen's poems. Either the Manibal poems, but of course, Manibal poems that fills 30 volumes, that's 4,001 poems. That's, uh, you always have to choose. There's also the Zen poems, and then sometime in the late 90s, he went on a crazy journey across Tibet and without food or altitude medicine, and so his Himalaya poems about Tibet. And his little poems, Flowers of a Moment, uh, or his epic poems, or his novel, the, the Buddhist novel, um, Palm Gyeong, Little Pilgrim in English. Uh, there are so many aspects, so much to go on. During the historic meeting between Kim Dae-jong and Kim Jong-il, he actually was next to them. How did that happen? Ah, <laughs> well, yes, well, that's the sort of thing that happens to go on. I mean, there were lots of people. Kim Dae-jung invited a whole set of people, all sorts of people, to be with him there. And um, then uh, the sort of, you know, official guys were negotiating behind closed doors, and they were rather surprised to find that they had an agreement, the North-South Agreement, which came out rather late the last evening. So the leaders were hastily summoned, because it was late, uh, they'd already had their banquet or whatever, and signed this agreement almost behind closed doors and in a hurry. And suddenly said, oh, but the, the journalists, the journalists. So yes, well, you must have something, you know. So they, they came out into this hall and they had wine, somebody produced some wine. And suddenly somebody said, what are we going to do? How are we going to mark this, do something? And somebody said, Cohen, he, he had to write a poem this morning. Actually, he had to write a poem for a Korean newspaper when he got back. So Cohen has a poem in his pocket. He can read the poem. Yes, yes. And a poem about the Taedong River, which flows through Pyongyang. Uh, so Cohen was summoned to read his poem and just to mark the occasion of the joint agreement. And then Kim Jong-il and Kim Dae-jong were holding glasses, and here's Cohen in the middle between them, so it's a very funny, po funny photograph. <laughs> Is Cohen universally appreciated in Korea, or does he have a more controversial stand? I'm sure he has lots of controversy for all sorts of reasons. Koreans don't like admiring people anyway, until they're dead. Cohen, uh, uh, because he was involved in opposition to Park Jong-hee, and we all know who the president is now. 
and she doesn't like people who opposed her father. Or she's wrong. But then that's another question. So Corton has always been a dissident, an oppositionist, but also he is very independent and he is also at times rather drunk, like lots of poets. And he's also very original and eccentric and he has been more than he is now because he's old now. Uh, so there are all sorts of other aspects of Colin that sometimes Koreans or he, and of course Korean writers are intensely divided among themselves into groups, parties, sects and so on. And they're all the time criticizing everybody else. So poor Colin, he just doesn't give a damn. He just does not give a damn what anybody thinks about him. He just goes ahead and does what he wants to do. Whether it's good or bad, it's not always good. But anyway, as he's now too old to to do anything very shocking. But Koreans, this is not Koreans reading his writing, because a lot of Koreans don't read his writing. They haven't read his writing. They haven't kept up. So they're just repeating gossip or something. So, of course, that's what happens. Koreans who know what he writes, and on the other hand, sometimes are not quite happy because he writes so much. They say he should write less, or not publish everything, you know, tear it up, and burn it, or whatever, select, but he doesn't. It sort of comes pouring out, and he said, you know, after I die, you open my grave, you'll find it full of poems. Cohen is now in his 80s. Does his work reach younger generations? I think so, because uh, once or twice there was a reading here in Shinchon not so long ago, and then we had a reading also in Myeongdong, and he gives lectures sometimes, in, he's given lectures recently in Yonsei or in Solde, and um, it's packed, packed with students, young people. Yes. Cohen has, has a name. I say they don't necessarily know much about his previous work or so, but still... For a lot of young people, he is definitely you know, a real name, and when he comes, when he does something, they want to be there and hear what he's saying. Does he play a role in Korea's public life, either as a public intellectual or maybe as a reclusive poet? Well, no, yes. Well, he's now been given a title of Peace Ambassador for UNESCO both Korean UNESCO and World UNESCO in Paris. So uh, last year, in the autumn last year, he was invited to the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris to give a talk and a reading as ambassador for UNESCO, peace ambassador for UNESCO to mark the 70th anniversary of UNESCO. Uh, that's one of his main things nowadays. And he's very much an intellectual. Uh, when he's talking, when he gives lectures, uh, it's challenging because he, what he says is often really difficult. It's not simple stuff. His vocabulary, the way he thinks, he's an extremely original thinker and the flow of his ideas are going in odd directions or unexpected directions. A special figure. Are some of his poems more famous than others? I heard you. I mean, what's famous? It depends who you are, everybody. I say he has too many poems. Almost nobody in the world has read everything Cohen wrote. Even Cohen. Once he's written a poem, zoom! <laughs> Next. And he's moving on again. The Man in Bow is a very special series, but again, there's 4,000 poems. So again, you don't really know if you, you know how to buy the 30 volumes. So for a lot of people, again, they don't know it. This is a problem. It's easier in a sense if you are approaching Cohen through translation because, like, I have published, what, 10 volumes of translations of Cohen. Choose one or two or three, but they're often quite short, you know, small. You can read them. But in Korean, I say, it just piles up 155 volumes. Where are you going to start? Uh, this is the main problem with Cohen. Are there specific techniques that are characteristic of Cohen's poetry? Well, the only thing is he keeps changing. So every time he's written one poem, the next poem may be totally different. 
uh, last year or year before he published a huge collection of poems, over a thousand pages, newly written poems, 600 and something untitled poems, just numbered. The one person in the world I know who has actually tried to read all 600 of those poems and all whole thousand pages, he said, he does keep repeating himself. But at the same time, it is true that even when he's repeating himself, somehow he's always reinventing himself at the same time. It's not quite the same poem. And you have some very short poems, and you have epic poems, several volumes long. I say then you have Zen poems about very Buddhist themes, and you have very short poems about moments of life. And so he's all the time reinventing himself. You wrote, and I quote, that Cohen's poetry often depends for its effect on a cumulative effect. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, because there's so much of it, you need to take it as it is, that's to say, in large doses, because he is not somebody working on each poem, spending days and days ang agonizing over every line and every word. But you have poem after poem after poem after poem after poem after poem. Somehow that is how you're going to have to approach Cohen because that's how he writes. Whereas you have some poets who in a whole lifetime have not written or not published a hundred poems. Is he a difficult poet to read for a Korean audience? A Korean? No. No, he's not a difficult poet. He's not a difficult poet. Man in Bo is simple. It's little flashes, little moments in a life, in this person's life or that person's life, and it may be somebody who was king in Kogurio, it may be a woman who was arrested and raped during the Korean War, it's about the children he used to play with in his childhood, it's about everybody, everybody, everybody. They're very simple, they're wonderful. As I say, the only problem is there's so many of them and Koreans are not going to have the books. They need, I keep saying, they need a little anthology, a single volume of selected poems, some of the most vivid, most entertaining, most... But he can't really do that because his idea is that the man in everybody, man in the records of everybody, so everybody all together constitute Korean history. It's the opposite of history from king, general, influential people. It's history from grassroots, history from the kids who died as kids, and history of the poor, history of pain, history of fun. It's another way of writing Korean history. What are the main themes and subjects that can be found in Cohen's poetry? <laughs> everything, everything, everything. Everything. There are not many poems about sex. Koreans don't talk about sex. There are poems about shit and thunder and birds throwing stones off bridges. Everything! <laughs> When you've written 155 books, there's not much left you haven't written about. Are there any topics beyond sex that he has not really written about? Well, he's never written a poem in praise of a dictator which is not something that can be said of every famous Korean poet. Buddhism clearly played a major part in Cohen's life. Is that a recurring theme in his poetry? Uh, if you ask him, he'll say that he is not a Buddhist writer, because he doesn't like labels, and that is somehow confining or defining, and he can't be defined because he wants just to be Cohen, or rather multiple the Cohens. He's a kind of company. But certainly, you see, Buddhism, he was a monk for ten years, yeah, and during that time he practiced Zen meditation um, very, very intensely, too intensely, it didn't help him really. Then he came out, and you had nihilism, and then you had the social involvement, the protests, and so. And then when the civilian presidents came in, Kim Yong-sam and then Kim Dae-jung, As soon as he felt that Korea had gone beyond the dictatorship, beyond military dictatorship, and that all this was, in a way, over, one of the first things he did was go back to a Buddhist novel that he had half-written before, Hwam Gyeong, and finish it. And his friends, supporters, were horrified. 
What? You're not out there protesting, going on with the struggle, international assembly, you write Buddhism? He said, yeah, I'm a writer. I need to write, and this is what I want to write. So he wrote the rest of Huang Gyeong, a lot of Zen poems, and he also did some novels about the lives of the early Zen patriarchs in China. But, as he says, you know, this is something he wants to write about. But it is not because he is a Buddhist. It's simply as Cohen, he wants to write about these people, these themes, and they interest him. But he will not let himself be confined within that as a definition of all he is. No, it's just one aspect. Important, yeah. Within the works of Cohen that have been translated in English, is there any specific theme that is more dominant? No, I don't think so. I, I wouldn't be able to say. I've, I say I've only published ten volumes, and uh, I really don't feel I can generalize because say, I say every poem is different. It was a poem here, I mean, that he calls a poem. One day it was a guest. One day it was the host. All those years, each of the chimneys was dreaming of the smoke it would send up. Today, I'm still not sure who a poem is. No, that's about that. <laughs> Is there any specific evolving trend observable within his poetry over the decades? I mean, in his early poetry was extremely passionate, but then after he came out of prison, he revised all those poems and got rid of a lot of the passion because he said it was evil. He didn't explain what he meant. Uh, and then, as I say, he went on writing all sorts of stuff, whether Buddhist poems and uh, Man in Bo and epic about the independence struggle. Uh, so, and uh, now, more domestic, maybe quieter, more... But it really is, there are just too much to it. Uh, it's not possible to generalize. From the viewpoint of a foreigner, is Cohen in his work, or in his public standing and role, comparable to any contemporary Western poet? No, because Western society doesn't need poets. Uh, in a way, I suppose he is like, or you can think about, some of the poets who were dissidents behind the Iron Curtain, or maybe also in China, because he has always been essentially a dissident, an outsider, a critical poet or a critical person not fitting in with what the ruling people want. So Western poets don't do that because nobody wants them to do anything, nobody cares what they say. So it's closer to a Beidou or to maybe Brodsky and there are poets in, in Eastern Europe who are closer to what he represents. In a recent interview, we discussed with Professor Willoughby the role of Han in Pansori. Do you believe that this Han, this extreme sorrow, played a role in Korean poetry at all, and in Cohen's poetry? Well, Han is a very ambiguous idea. I'm not sure it really exists. But if it does exist, you can only understand Han as being the uh, counterpoint of Hung. And the poetry and the art and the music and the pansori have much more to do with Hung than they do with Han. Because there is Han, you have to resist, you have to hold on, and you are not going to be overcome by all this misery, the Han. And the way of not being overcome by misery is by a word that Koreans love, kudedo. Nonetheless, still, notwithstanding, we will sing and dance and rejoice and smile. We will overcome in that way. So Hung goes with Han. And uh, Ko Wun would definitely agree with that. Uh, for Ko Wun, poetry is above all the expression of Hung. Han is what you can't do anything about. But Hung is doing something about Han. How do you see the future of Korean poetry? Is there a new generation of poets coming? <laughs> They've already come. <laughs> Hundreds of them. Uh, most of them writing extremely difficult poetry because it's very hard now for young Koreans, whether poets or novelists, to know what they ought to be writing about. In the old days, you could write, you know, 
covert attacks on authoritarianism, dictatorship, or whatever, and proclaim the dignity of humans in their suffering. But now, when anything goes, and the government thinks that K-pop is something, um, what can you do? So that the young poets, I say, they are writing poems which the older poets say, I don't know what they mean. They have to go back to the fragmentation, to symbolism, uh, to incoherence, more or less the meaninglessness of consumerist lives and urban living and so not everybody but an awful lot especially young poets who are say now in their 30s 20s and 30s they're having a very hard time and even be in older poets too if they uh, a lot of the poetry out there is really very hard to pin down or enjoy it's not really enjoying poetry it's poetry about i say about meaninglessness and about the uncertainty of value and meaning and lots so what are your next projects now well i've got five or six or seven books due to come out the most interesting one is a kind of anthology that i was asked to to ed- help edit so it's going to come out in hawaii uh, it's a nice place to come out. I think it's an anthology of about 44 different poets, some of them dead, long dead, some of them one or two who were born or right at the start of the 20th century who wrote in the Japanese period, and it goes right through. And the most recent poets, the young poets, some of them are still in their 30s. And it's those are the poets who come first. It's arranging going in backward chronological order so the old guys the dead guys are the at the back and you start with the with today's poets well, selection uh so that's going to come out and that that's nice it's i think it'll be a very nice book and it gives people then insight into a lot of different aspects you know there are 10 poems by Cohen, there are 10 poems by kim sung hee there are this 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 40 from all from right through uh that will be a useful introduction too and it also has actually a kind of history of korean poetry that i wrote without knowing anything to conclude could you read us a poem in korean chan sang byong gui chan na han lo thora garira se byok bit gwa ta myeon seo jin on isul dobro Sone son ro chap ko na han lo do ra ga de ra no ol pi tam ke tan tu di so ki so ge so no ta ga kurum son chi tam ya non na han lo do ra ga de ra arm da on i se sang so pum kun na no na ka so arm da wat do ra go ma ha ri ra I'll go back to heaven again hand in hand with the dew that melts at a touch of the dawning day. I'll go back to heaven again, with the dusk together, just we two, at a sign from a cloud after playing on the slopes. I'll go back to heaven again. At the end of my outing to this beautiful world, I'll go back and say that was beautiful. Brother Anthony, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.